When I talk about the apostles of the Lamb, the original twelve that were with him, of course you know that Judas became a betrayer and he died. Amongst all the apostles of the Lamb, the one upon whom the ministry and the life of Jesus had the most profound effect was John. And it would be good to look at him and see what happened in his life. What triggered the change in his life to get him to the point where he then began to pen the things that he wrote down in the epistles that we'll be looking at this afternoon. There are things that I hope I can leave with you today because there will be points of encouragement for you as they were to me that every one of those apostles who started with Jesus that we look at today uh, they were not finished off you know what I mean by finished off they were not people that were already made they were people like you and me and take time to take the lives of each one of them, particularly those that wrote the word. I studied the life of Peter. I studied the life of uh, Andrew, the first person that Jesus called. And you will find certain things that I will encourage you. That you may be who you are today. Who you are today is not who you are going to be tomorrow. And the most important factor that is going to change who you will be tomorrow is the word of God, the impact of the world. John's brother was, what was his name? What was the name of his brother? James. James. They were sons of a successful businessman, fisherman. For a person, for a fisherman to own a boat in that time. You must be a rich man. And if you look at the time when Jesus called them, they were actually washing. They said, the fact that they said, the, the nets with which they were catching fish, there were people who were washing that net for them. So they came from a rich background. And the nature of their lives as 
children that came from a rich background told a lot of story in terms of the relationship John had with Jesus and what was it that happened in the life of Jesus, for John by the influence of Jesus. John's mother was a woman called Salome. If you go to John chapter 19, those who are watching, those who are standing by when Jesus was crucified on the cross, they named the list of all the people who were there. It turned out that Salome also was the sister. I don't know whether it's now the elder or the younger sister to the mother of Jesus. So, for those who are wondering, uh, now I'm speaking many things that I dare not say in my own assembly because people will misunderstand them. So, I had no problem in having Pastor Tokes married to Miss Mockridge being Mama in Israel, and then I have Pastor Andrew Mockridge, who is her younger brother, also a pastor in the church, something that people will frown on. If people understood relationships that surrounded Jesus Christ, there will be less of bigots in the way they look at people. Amen. I was in Florida uh, while I was on vacation. The pastor in um, Jimmy's church, where I have ministered over the years, and the man has been having extreme difficulties. We will be celebrating his 80th year next year. And what was the cause of his problem? He wanted one of his sons to succeed him, and none of the sons had neither the grace nor the gravity in terms of the word to succeed him. And for the last three years, I had watched that congregation go down. As I sat with him, I'm going somewhere, so don't sleep on me. If you sleep, I will throw this thing at you. <laughs> Amen? I asked about the congregation. But because Jimmy, my friend, told me I knew the competition was in trouble. So he then he, he, he came up with the courage. He said, your children, what are you thinking about in terms of succession? And I told him, let me say something to you, Pastor. You are wasting the lives of the church and God will ask you. Yes! In the ironic priesthood, the issue of succession is because God ordained it to be so. But you cannot carry ironic priesthood into the Melchizedek priesthood. The people like John Hagee and um, Papa Hagin that did it, because the children themselves had the grace and the gravity in terms of their work and the knowledge of God, but you ask, since you asked me the question, how am I doing my congregation, let me say this to you. My youngest son, Joel, who is a minister in his own right, if Joel takes the scriptures and divides it for you, I am not overrating him. Even with my own pastors, Joel will stand toe-to-toe with them when it comes to design this. And I said to him, Joel can only come and minister there. He will never succeed me because that's not... <laughs> First of all, it is not, it is not, uh, how do I say that now? It is, it's, that's, that I, <laughs> that's not the way it is in the New Testament. The scripture said, He gave gifts unto them. God gave men as gifts. It's men coming to minister and bringing their grace in the different assemblies. And if my son, wants to come and visit as he has done only once since we came because I made sure that that opportunity in fact, if it was not for Pastor Tokes that insisted that since he is in the country he must minister I had, it's not I had made sure that the question of him coming to minister in the church I've seen him minister I've been in places where he ministered and I know even 
your cousins and co in the US whom you communicate with, they know. But the point I'm making, <coughs> let us not model the old into the new. Like Jesus said, if you put new wine into old skin, you will make a rent and tear it up. That's an aside. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is relationship in the body of the Lord, the way it was with Jesus. I never knew until I studied that Salome was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That while David's father, while, while Jesus' father was a poor carpenter, the husband of the sister was a rich woman, was a rich man. Salome herself was rich, and you will find in the book of Luke, when they, when they were recounting the names of the women that supported Jesus, she was amongst them. Why am I saying this? You are the people who are going to be carrying the word around. Who are going to be dis- talking the word of God in your country. Don't get entangled by things that are not scriptural or by the fact that you don't have the depth of knowledge in the word of God that allows you to know how to manage relationships. <coughs> I've said this once in my own, I mean, in my own congregation. Nobody recommended Andrew to me. I had a clear vision that it is incontrovertible the circumstance in which he, which he rose in the assembly. And all of you are witnesses to the progress of what God has done in the life of that man when it comes to the world. I seem to be emphasizing this. I know we're talking about abiding. But I'm dealing with the things that make it difficult to abide. That's why I'm going in this direction. The things that make it difficult to abide, bigotry, oh, is the brother of this one, is the brother of that one, that's why we are trying, he's trying to lord it over us and so on and so forth. That's not the way in the body of the Lord. Are you with me? Oh, because she looks so much alike like, like her, or she is the daughter of Mama here, you then find the reason that why she's ministering, or God gives her a specific minister, oh, it's because she is Mama's daughter. Mm. You don't recognize the grace of God that is upon her life. Amen. The things that make it difficult to abide in the love of God comes from not, one of them comes from not recognizing the grace of God that is upon your brother, the grace of God that is upon your sister. Rather, your own fleshly ways get in the way. Let's get back on track. So John was that close to Jesus. Then you will understand where he said, that disciple whom the Lord what? Whom the Lord loved. In fact, such was the closeness of the Lord Jesus and John that before the, before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, John took care of his personal affairs. John was like the PA of Jesus. Always sat at the right hand. Go and look at when they sat at the table for, for the Lord's Supper. And that's why on the cross, when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, you remember the statement that Jesus made? Look at your son, son, look at your mother. And the scripture said, from that day, John did what? Took Mary. To his own house. (coughs) Relationship between Jesus and John was that deep. Although it started on the basis of 
Uh, she's, the, she's the son of my of my of my mother's sister, of my auntie. Thank you, teacher. But it brought a closeness between them, and that closeness did something, and that's where I'm really going in the, explaining the scripture that I gave you in Matthew chapter thirteen fifty four. What characterized the life of this man called John? There are so many scriptures here. I've spoken, I've spoken them, but if anybody is asking for proof, I can give all the proof is here. So that you can on your own search out the things that I've said, and it's not just coming from my head. John did have at least one brother whose name was James. Mark 4.21. James was also one of the twelve, a member of the inner, inner three. And uh, you know when James was dead, that's the quote that we find out in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11, thereabouts, and Acts chapter 12. And Peter was, uh, Peter was the next one that was going to be killed. But what were the good traits in the life of this man that you call John? And what were the wrong traits? I'm going to take them because it is from that you'll be able to see what I'm trying to bring out. That's the something that changes a person. It's the presence of Jesus in your life that changes you. It's the relationship of Christ in your life that changes you. John had many lovely, lovely traits. In fact, he's called the Apostle of Love. He loved the church, encouraged the brethren to love themselves. He thrived always on being around Jesus, being one of the first disciples to follow him after John did the baptism. Of all the disciples, when they took Jesus to, 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 the, uh, to the high priest, who was the only person who could enter? It was John. Every other person went to him. In fact, John had to negotiate for Peter to come in. And may God raise up somebody who will be able to let you enter in places that you cannot enter. John was such a person. He was able, I mean, he could have had a chip on his shoulder. But the relationship with Peter was such that he, he, he got Peter to come into the place. And looking at those positive characters of his life. He was courageous. He was the only one that we read of record. That was standing. When Christ was actually crucified. John was very very aggressive. In dealing with heresies. As you will see when we get to 1 John chapter 4 proper. And. John was the servant, was the servant of Jesus, whom the Lord said to go and prepare a place for him when they were going to have that last supper. John was a person of prayer. You saw that very clearly. Those who went to the top of the mountain with him to the top of Mount of Transfiguration to pray, he was one of them. John was a man of the word. I want you to note these characteristics in the life of this man. He was a man of the word. Because if you go through the gospel of St. John, there are many statements that John made. Where he said, all of these things were fulfilled as the scriptures have written. If he had no knowledge of the scriptures, he couldn't make such a statement. Four things. He was a man of the word. A man of prayer. A man who loved the Lord. Was always around him. Ready to serve him. He was a man who also loved his brethren. The strongest character of John was his dependability. You could depend on him. You could rely on him. That's why Jesus, amongst all the disciples, could point to him and say, This is your mother. And this so dependable was he that Jesus was willing to entrust the care of his mother to him. 
Note those characters. Positive. But do you know that as positive as those characters were, there were some very, very bad traits in the life of John. And as I said to you earlier on, between Tosa, Tolu, Tumi, will you say because this one is like this, you will not give him food. You will not be a good one. Because you are expecting the best out of the lives of his ones. Can anybody figure out one bad trait in the life of John if you have read your joy, if you have read the Gospel of St. John well? Yes? Self centered. And do you know what scripture she had in mind when she said she was self centered? Do you know? Don't give the answer. Hmm? I don't believe this. I certainly do not believe this. What could she be referring to that led her to the conclusion that John was self-centered? When, when who was arrested? Hmm. You know now that I want to you want somebody who wants to sit at the right hand. A person to sit at have you didn't you read that in the scriptures before? That I may sit I want to sit at the right hand of a few in when you get to the kingdom of God. Was it the only one? Amongst twelve people, you are looking out for yourself alone. You, know. you get? You get? Yes, sir. That self conceit was something that was evident in his life. Something that was this self-admiring, arbitrary and inordinate but usually well-concealed conceit young man. When he was only 24 when he joined the ranks of the apostles. I'm picking this point slowly. Showing the good and showing the bad. For you to know that the fact that you are not perfect today doesn't disqualify you. You are the only one who can disqualify yourself. But we are not condoning the wrong things because the wrong things Jesus corrected. And the product of that correction is what became the apostle of love. Are you with me? So that you don't sit down and say you are good. You will be fit for judgment and burning. I just told you that good is the enemy of the best. So he was self-conceited, very, very hot-tempered. You remember when Jesus said to them to go forward, and Jesus was going into a village of, uh, of, 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 of Samaritans. And then, because people didn't want Jesus to pass through, who was the first to speak about calling down fire? John, they disrespected my master, therefore we should destroy them. And I pray that you will get and learn some lesson from here. Lessons that I pray that all of you will understand in being able to tolerate one another. This was, look, Jesus did not throw John away. This was the event that made his name to be called the Son of Thunder. But Jesus said to him, You do not know what spirit that is in you. The same one that was seeking to call down fire was the one who turned to become the apostle of love. self conceit very hot-tempered, and extremely, extremely bigoted. There was a third thing that showed the kind of record, the, 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 the character that this man had that was not acceptable. Some people were preaching Christ. You remember? Who are not in the congregation, who are not among the disciples. 
And then they went and told Jesus. We saw some people who are preaching in your name. Shall we stop them? And Jesus said, whoever is not against me is for me. This closed circle thing, they are Babylon. It has no foundation in the world. Those three things were negative traits in the life of this man. But what I wanted to point out was that Jesus didn't throw him away for that. Jesus corrected him and built him up. One of the things that we miss was that when he asked Jesus, Jesus about being, being, being on his right and on his left, there was a prophetic utterance that Jesus made on that day concerning James and John. Who remembers what it is that they said Jesus asked them? Are you able to what? Said, are you able to beer drink of the cup? Oh, this place is so quiet. You, don't you know the scriptures? Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to. These things are not Old Testament, but I will say it's difficult to. These are all New Testament things. So when they said to Jesus that we may sit on your right hand and on your left hand, Jesus said to them, are you able to drink of the cup? And they said, yes, we will drink. And Jesus said, yes, you will surely drink. That day was the prophecy that was spoken so that when James was killed, some people would be crying, but they forgot that prophecy has gone ahead. That the killing of James was in fact a precursor to the greater glory that James himself desired. James himself said it to the Lord. We will drink of the cup that you are drinking. And Jesus said, yes indeed, you will drink of that cup. James was killed. And you know also that John was banished for four years until there was a change in the in the in the in the ruler on the emperorship of Rome. While he was in the Isle of Patmos, they put him in boiling boiling oil. But he didn't die. Your lives are ordered in the hands of God. That's why you shouldn't deal with yourselves anyhow. <coughs> Don't treat your brother or your sister anyhow. As long as you are standing in the faith, there is a purpose for which God has called him, for which God has called you, for which God has called you. He may not understand it, but work together in love. I hope there are a few things that I'm telling I'm going slow to throw this out because if I don't lay this foundation right, it will not be very clear what I'm trying to bring forth to you. What Matthew 13, 54, 52 was saying, that you have to progress from being just a teacher of religious law to being a disciple. There is a process. The presence of the Lord for those three and a half years in the life of John was what began to work that change that turned this man from the color down of fire to one who is the apostle of love. Praise the Lord. Have you followed? <coughs> and I've gone through this for your help. First of all, that the negative things of your life, God is able and he wants to change. Except you by yourself walk away. John stood and accepted the criticism. He knew the lordship of Jesus. He knew enough of what was coming ahead in terms of the kingdom of heaven. And he was willing to allow Jesus to walk through his life. I don't know what it is that God has proposed to achieve in your life. But that you are here means that there is purpose for you. It's up to you 
to let God work that out. So having dealt with this very, very important foundation, the main encounter with God was on that, uh, was that month of transfiguration when Jesus took Peter, John, and James up to the top of the mountain. On that mountain, Jesus was transfigured. The brightness of his glory was made known. Again at the foot of, Jesus, at the, foot of the cross, a momentous occasion when Jesus <coughs> purchased my salvation. When Jesus purchased your salvation. John was in, in prison several times. Banished to the Isle of, Mas, uh, of Patmos for a period of four years until there was a change of, a change of government as it were. It was these experiences of life that this man had post the resurrection of Jesus that sowed the seed of what is the foundation of abiding and it then exploded and expounded in John chapter 15. That abiding actually means reproducing the nature of God in yourself. Reproducing the nature of God in yourself. And how does that happen? Let's go to John 15. Because the very, very foundation of the principles of abiding are those things that were laid out in there. Now, I said, continue with that in, in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. There's, very quickly, you give that to me, and then we'll look at John 15. Acts chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Verse 14. Verse 14. Yes. Now, when the apostles who were at, the, at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they sent who? John and who? And Peter. You will see something that begins to manifest here. When the, the, the man who was lame, silver and gold have I known, but such as I have, I give unto you. Who and who are they? Oh, talk to me now. Same Peter and John. This scripture that you just looked that you just read to you was what Peter and John. Shouldn't there be a struggle between the two of them? Shouldn't there be? Human nature will say, okay, master has gone now. Who is going to be who is going to be recognized as the leader? And I'm speaking to all of you. Particularly the the council the, 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 the council. The council of the, the, the youth council that directs you, that directs your affairs. These people understood enough that God's purpose for your life, God's purpose for your life, they are different. But they are what? They are complementary. They are complementary. Why are you creating problems where there are no problems? Why do you let your flesh and your own personal perceptions override the counsel of God that He wants to fulfill in having you together as a council? And please listen to me. I pray that tomorrow I will be able to bring this out in depth. For then we will understand what God is trying to do with us. I think it was Sam Etitu that said, uh, well, let's wait till tomorrow. I don't want, let me not do that now. If we understand that God chooses to use a counsel not because he can do all that he wanted to do alone. He could do it by himself. 
But by choice, he chose to have a council around him. I'm just a member of that council. I'll do my part. You will do your part. Shadrach will do his part. B will do her part. Do your part. Recognize your part. And do your part. And don't stand quarreling about the next person. Peter had that problem. And the Lord Jesus shot him up. He said, Just feed my lamb. It's not your business if I choose that this man should not die until I return. Just do your part. And as you go forward, I pray that these things will be... Because this, for me, and what I'll do tomorrow is probably the most important of what I'll ever share with you. In terms of recognizing the relationships, the complementarity of the graces that God puts upon your individual lives, so that you can work together in love, rather than looking and saying, Namibia, Oga. There is no Oga in this thing. There is no Oga. I said it before and I say it again. When Paul was giving that illustration in the book of Corinthians, when he said somebody will somebody will well, how did you put it now? And then somebody somebody will plant and somebody, another person will water. I hope well I grew up in I, I grew up in the village, so I know what it means to you know, when you are planting. You break the you break the earth and so on. Between the person that is breaking the earth and so on and so forth, and the person who is watering, who is doing more work? The man who is breaking his back. But look at the way Paul gives it and says every man will receive his own reward back. He didn't put one above the other. Recognizing your place and doing your own. Recognizing your place and doing your own. You will get the whole reward. This man who was so bigoted, who looked out for his own interest, and so on and so forth, was the man who now became the apostle of God. Who became so accommodating when he understood the things he understood concerning abiding. Let's go to John 15 now. Um, John let's take it, let's, let's, no, just take it from verse 4. Take it from verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. Mm -hmm. As I, the branch, cannot bear fruit as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, is there only one, one branch in a tree? Oh. Several branches. If you just look back, several branches in a tree. A tree that has only one branch has a problem. It's unnatural. Every branch has its place in the body. And that's the same thing that Paul began to illustrate when it was you, it was lightening the body, the, 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 the body of the, the, the body in the manner in which God gave grace to different people. Every branch must bring forth fruit of itself. And every branch stands in its own place in the body. Because the life sustenance of the branch, it comes from whatever it is that comes from the roots through the stem. And I'm emphasizing that. Because those are the things that John understood. When in staying with Jesus, he recognized that Philo has a part, Mama B has a part, every one of you have your part. Why don't you understand that? And let the life of Christ flow through you. So that you will bring forth fruits according as the grace that he puts in you. 
she will bring forth fruits according to the grace that is put in her. Every branch has its own place. So look behind you there. Look behind you. It's asleep. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just look behind you. Look at, uh, look, look, look at the branches there. Look at the branches there. I'm serious. Look at the branch of that tree. The, the branches of that tree. Is, can one displace the other? Is it displacing the other? It's not. It doesn't even have the capacity. It's fixed. You are looking at it. There are those are look at that tree, the branches that you see there. It can't even move from where it is to say I'll push you out. Or I'll push this one out. Look at it. It's very epic. It has to be a branch that has some strange spirit in it. And that's the positioning that John was making obvious to all of us that we don't see. What is important for each branch is what we just read. Read it again. Abide in me and yes. I in you. Yes. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Now look at the way the Lord was dictated, directing the word here. He never said the branches. Every branch must abide in its place that is assigned to him and bring forth fruit. I, I, I don't know how better to say to put it. But other than to use the, illust- the illustration because this, the, the illustration is perfect because as God has positioned it in such a way that a branch has a fixed position and its productivity is dependent on the intake from the roots into the body of the branch. These are the things that Brother John understood when he began to speak about if a man does not love his brother, how can he say that the love of God is in him? Oh, I'm not sure I'm getting across to you. But do you understand me? Yes. Are you following because it's very important. The specifics of, ab- of abiding are tied to the fact that it's the life of Christ that is going through you that makes you to be fruitful. My fruitfulness is not dependent on the fact that I push somebody out of the place to be able to take his place or her place. It doesn't make sense. It's not natural. What it is that God called you to do, that he endowed you to do, do it best. Don't look the other way. Because it only leads to the wrong thing. Hmm. The believers in the congregation, uh, let, let me back up now. Apart from Revelation 1, the New Testament is silent about the later years of, of this John. But early Christian tradition uniformly tells us that he left Jerusalem and that he ministered in and around Ephesus. The seven churches in the Roman province of Asia that are mentioned in what we thought in Revelation chapter 2 were evidently a part of this ministry because John was a follow-on after Paul, after Paul was killed. The believers in these congregations were well established in the truth. And John wrote to them, not as novices, but as brethren who are grounded in the apostolic God doctrine. And that's why I keep saying, abiding in the stem, as our sister was reading. Please go on and let's try and, and, and finish that verse. First that time. time. Yes. I am the vine. Yes. You are the branches. Yes. He who abides in me. And I in him bears much fruit. Mm-hmm. For without me you can do nothing. You heard what the uh, pastor said in the morning? Faith takes and reproduces to give. The branch that is logged in into Jesus receives of Jesus to reproduce Jesus. And that's the manner in which God has set each one of us in his body to function and bring forth fruit 
and reproduce the life of Christ. Said so, the believers in these congregations established in Christian in truth were grounded in, in the apostolic doctrine. The apostle does not mention his own personal affairs, but his use of such terms as their friends, their children gives a very personal touch that speaks of the kind of relationship that he had with these people. If there was anything that was unique in the ministration of this brother, it was his constant fight against the allure of worldliness and the guile of false teachers. They were present in his days. And if there is anything you guys should be fighting, it's not yourself. As, you are, as long as you are standing in the truth, it's against false doctrine you want to fight. Praise the Lord. Let's finish that bit. I am the vine, you are the branches. Yes. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Your capacity to reproduce the life of Christ is inextricably tied to your continuing in Christ. If the life of Christ is not flowing through you, you can't reproduce. And what you reproduce has to be like him. Otherwise, you are not in him. Abiding, like I said, is reproducing the nature of who? Of God. And that's the whole treatise that is in there. Go on, please. If anyone does not abide in me, yes. he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, mm -hmm. and they are burned. Mm -hmm. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, mm -hmm. you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Mm -hmm. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Your reproduction of the life of God is what brings glory to God. And these are the things that John crystallized into that verse in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. I hope you follow the trail of a man close to Jesus and his closeness to Jesus was of such transformative uh, influence on his life that the negative things about his life were turned around for him to become the positive influence that he was. And the kind of things that characterized his life after are the things we are looking at that made him become the apostle of law. 1 John uh, um, 4.16 uh, Take it, start from 1 John 3.24 1 John 3.24 Verse 24 mm -hmm. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him mm -hmm. and he in him mm -hmm. and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. You know that God abides in you by the presence of his spirit that is in you. And Paul, John deliberately started here identifying what is the thing that is influencing in you that identifies you as God. Because later on, he let it be known that there is another spirit that is at work. The same pattern in which Paul was speaking. The same pattern in which Jesus was speaking be false. Mm -hmm. The important thing is for you to be in the truth and to resist the false because the false always wants to destroy the truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus also spoke about the, dry, the, net, the net which was cast wide and he caught all manner of fish. And Jesus separated the fish and then he put on the other side all the ones, that, all the scorpions of this world, the two natures are going to be present. And that's why he was insisting here, said this same one, can you read that verse again, sister? Verse 24. Anyone who says he has, he has his, go on. Now he who keeps his commandments, the one who keeps his commandments, abides in him. Is the one who abides in him. And he in him. Yes. And by this we know that he abides in us. The evidence of 
abiding of the Lord in you is the presence by of the Spirit of, whom He has given us. Of the Spirit of God. And if you are displaying a spirit that is different from the Spirit of God, it should be obvious. And I will show you how to tell them apart. Go on, just read on until you are going into what is one John chapter four now. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Now remember he started here in just one three twenty four saying the spirit of God is the only way by which we will know who is abiding. And then he says something here. Don't believe every spirit. Because but, there are spirits that are out there that are different from the spirit that God has given you that allows us to know that you are abiding. Yes? But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Mm -hmm. And this is the spirit of the, the, Antichrist, mm -hmm. the Antichrist, which you have heard he was coming and is now already in the world. Mm -hmm. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is, who is in the world. Mm. They are of the world. <laughs> Now, you are at this linkage is what I wanted to see. There is the Spirit of Christ that allows us to know that you are abiding. There is a different Spirit that is out there that your responsibility is to test, not to be part of. Remember what we read. How Paul spoke in Acts chapter 20, that he gave them no room while, they were, while he was there. Now, there is a Spirit of the Antichrist. That's who you are fighting against. Not yourselves. The spirit of false doctrine is what you are fighting against. Now, let's see how they are identified here. They are of the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world. Now, you will read that particular verse in NLT. You will read it in, 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 in NIV. But the point that is making here, when everything that is coming out from your mouth, everything that you are speaking, it's about the world. Then you have a different spirit. It is not difficult to know. If all that child, I try, how am I going to get that girl? I must get that girl. I must get that girl. You have a strong spirit. It's not funny. We are speaking to ourselves now. If all that's in my heart, That job, I must be there. I must get that car. I must get that house. Don't you see how there are houses? Don't you see how there are houses? Everything that you are speaking is just about what is out there. It's an indicator of the spirit that is in you. Please. And our team. Mm. Those people, those people belong to this world. Yes. So they speak from this world's viewpoint. They are always speaking from the point of view of the world. And, and the world listens to them. Now there, is, there are so many things that are going on that we just explain away. I preach against lesbianism and gayism or whatever it is because then somebody comes and says. I'm not politically correct. I should. I said you are sick. <laughs> when you begin to defend things that are contrary to God, we know the truth that is in you. That is why the legacy of Obama will never stand. It will be forgotten. Because he did two things that are totally, totally anti-God. For you, to be on the throne and they legalize uh, LGBT and LGBT. For them to, to you say you are, and then you are the one that is saying they should now vote against Israel. Two things. Did he never read that he that blesses Israel I will bless, and he that curses Israel I will curse? 
That man is finished. Forget that he's a black man. I am sorry for, I'm sorry that he's a black man. The, the worst two things that anybody could do to contradict God when God says, For this cause shall a man leave his father's house and, and, his, and his wife, they shall be joined and be one. And then, under your watch, you appoint judges who allow Steve to marry Dave and Delphine to marry Josephine. And then you are saying that you are. Oh. Please, let me just stop here because each time I remember, it's almost like cursing the man. But what am I saying? My son, everything in this world that you are seeing, you must always see from the point of view of the Bible. You hear me? Everything in this world, think in the scriptures, speak in the scriptures. Your arguments must be in the scriptures. Anything different from that is speaking to something different. It's the spirit of error. You need to be careful. And that's how you know those who are preaching the truth. If what they are said, if what they are saying is not in alignment with what is here, then throw it away. Read it again. Those people belong to this world. Those people so, belong to this world, yes. So they speak from the world's viewpoint. So they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. And the world will always listen to them. That's why you will always be in the minority. You will always be what? A minority. It is there. I'm just explaining the pages of the scriptures to you. There is a different spirit that is out there. That's what you should fight, not yourselves. That's what you should contend against, not yourselves. Please go back and let's continue from where you, you can. You can still be reading it from that one. You are in verse six now, I suppose. Yes. Sir. Yes. But we belong to God. Aha. And those who know God listen to us. Ooh. You are not sent to everybody. Who Look, after you have just told him the truth and you've preached the word to him and he doesn't like it, you're not obliged to stay with him. You have done your job. The power of conversion belongs to Jesus Christ alone. You are just the spokesperson. Do your part, speak your part, and walk away. Please. If they do not belong to God... They do not listen to us. This is, that is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for the love comes from for love comes from God. Anyone who loves, anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And yes, Lord. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Mm -hmm. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. Verse 16. Verse 16. Yeah. That's what you just read. Read it in, and Because it's important for you to understand when I say abiding in the love of God, I've said abiding is actually the nature of God being reproduced in you. Let me um, take this now so we, we can then. The mutual abiding of a believer in God and God in the believer is manifested in two ways. If you say you are abiding in God and God is abiding in you, two things will show. That's what I'm saying. Two things will show. Number one is that you love others too. If you don't love others, you are just deceiving yourself oh, that you are abiding in God and God is abiding in you. Look, I'm just 
stating what she read, breaking it down for you. If you say you are abiding in the love of God, the two ways in, that will show that, that allow that to be recognized, one is that you love others. And that this love, secondly, produces a divine and human fellowship that testifies to the reality of who Christ is. So if I say I'm abiding and God is abiding in me and I'm abiding in God and then Sister B does something and the only thing that I can think of is how I'm going to just get my hands of a pound of flesh. I'm going to get my pound of flesh back. The spirit of vengeance is not of God. Because vengeance belongs to God alone, except you are saying you are God. Except you are saying that you have become God. You must learn all of the things that Paul now wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, uh, yes, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When he began to speak about love. Sorry, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They are all predicated on this. That the evidence of abiding is that I also love others. And remember what Pastor Fook said here this morning. When he used that illustration of going behind the door to pay for some people. That's exactly what Jesus did for me. I am number one convict ready to be killed. And justly too. Because the word of God is sold as sin. Eh? No, no, guilty as charged. And he then said, okay, you are right, he's guilty. But I will pay the price. And he gave his life. So that if your brother offends you, I know that you are thinking about is how you are going to pay back. You are not abiding in God. And God is not abiding in you. These things are crucial for the bonding of the body, for the work to be effective and productive in your hands. The mutual abiding of the believer in God and God in the believer is manifested in love for others, number one. And two, that love produces a divine and human fellowship that reflects the life of Christ. This concept that John has presented in that verse 16 There is no board here. I wanted to show you an, um, the circle that is the unbroken circle that people try to represent. When they say you are married, they give you a ring. They say it's a circle of uh, an, um, an unbroken circle. I wanted to show you what that circle, where it came from. I don't think those who even made this one understood it. But I will, if can you get me a board? I want to show you the six things, the six things that form that circle that should be reproduced in anybody, anybody, anybody who is saying that yes, he is abiding in God and God in him. John joins these concepts that he has presented in a, to a circular chain of six links that begins with the love for the brethren. Number one, love for believers is the inseparable product of the love of the love for God. 1 John 4 verse 20 and 1 John 5 verse 1. That's the element number one. Element number two. Love for God arises out of obedience to his commandments. We read that. 1 John chapter 5 verse 2 and verse 3. Okay. 
Okay. Can you find me? Can it? it would have been great to just be able to illustrate to you in that circle. Because in the same way as he walks in the body of the Lord, that's the same way he walks in the relationship between a husband and a wife. That's why they give a ring. I'll start it again if we don't get it. Yes, yes. Okay. Number one. Yes. Love for believers is the inseparable product of the love for God. 1 John 4, verse 20 to 1 John 5, verse 1. We read that already. Love for God arises out of obedience for God. If any man loves me, let him keep my commandments. 1 John 5, verse 2 and verse 3. So we can see love for God, obedience in the love for God. And then, number three, obedience to God is the result of faith in Christ. 1 John 5, 4 to 5. 1 John, 4, ver, ver, 1 John, 1 5, John 5, 4 to 5. Verse 4 and 5, yes. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this? And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. See, obedience to God is the result of your faith in the sacrifice that Jesus has made. So you can see how these things are connected. Point number four. This faith that was in Jesus, who was the Christ, not only at his baptism, remember when John baptized him in water, but also at his death in the blood that was shed. Because you can't say, look, if, if any man believes, those that believe they were what? They were what? They were baptized. Those that believed, they were baptized. Jesus himself, the very first point was, oh, God bless you. Can you set it up? ring that speaks to 
the issue of abiding in the law of God and you abiding in God. First of all, love for believers was the first thing that we spoke and read in that 1 John 4 verse 20 to verse to chapter 5 verse 1. And quickly following that, if any man loves me, let him do what? Keep my word. <coughs> Obedience to the Lord is the evidence that follows. The third one, because when you say you obey, the only way you came to obey was because of the faith that you had in Christ Jesus. Right? Because if you, do, if you don't believe him, if you don't believe the witness that was given of him, and that's what we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 5. The fourth crucial element, this faith in Jesus, because there are many things that people have tried to contest. Oh, he came in the flesh, he didn't come in the flesh, and so on and so forth. We know he came in the flesh. He was baptized, and he died on the cross. And that's the witness that John was reading. If you will take those, 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 two, those two verses, 1 John 5, 6 and 8, please. Read it in King James, whichever one you have. So. This, is who, this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. Mm -hmm. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, the biggest contention by the Gnostics, of those, that's what they call them in that day, they were the ones who said, forget this idea of saying that Jesus came in the flesh. He was a spiritual Jesus. Therefore, they were cursing, they were shaking the faith of the people, because when you take the fact that Jesus came in the flesh and died for me away. Then you can hide under all kinds of things. And do all kinds of things. Right? For the Gnostics, they began to do things that were unspeakable. And that's why the likes of Paul, the likes of Paul, the likes of Peter, the likes of Jude, kept hammering on false doctrine. And then the faith in Jesus, that about, sorry, which you just read, by, by water and by whatever, that divine person, that divine witness, is you also then begin to speak to people about Jesus, if you don't believe. said, so we speak because we do what? We speak because what? We speak because what? We believe. To trigger me to be able to say the things that I believe. And when you give the divine witness of Jesus, he says, you will ask me whatever it is, and then I will do what? I will give it to you. This complete circle were the things that I that would be manifest in my life and in your life if indeed you are abiding in God. If indeed you are abiding in God, every single one of these six are products that will be manifest in you. The Lord. And then the things that he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you that you may bear fruit and that your fruit should do what? And then, please give me that John 15, John 15, 16 and 17. John 15, 16 and 17. Because everything that were then translated to the things written in this epistle, were founded upon the foundation that Jesus Christ laid in the interaction between him and John as he laid down to his word. Yes, please. You did not choose me. You didn't choose me. But I chose you. I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Now, go and bear fruit is the what? The divine witness that you give. Yes? And that your fruit should remain. And that the fruit should remain. That whatever you ask of the Father... And then when... That is the condition. Oh, people, you look, people quote that verse 17. If true, if you have, whatever it is you ask in my name, the Father will do it. They forget that there is a precondition to it. Amen. The precondition to it, you bear fruit, and you are free to what? Your fruit abide. Then will you ask me, whatever... 
And then my father is going to do what? My father will do it. Beloved, abiding in his love, the reproduction of the life of God in you, and the manifest elements are in this ring. Someday, when what is the cause for it? I want to show you this as it's replicated, supposed to be replicated in the husband marrying a wife and in the giving of a ring. Because the same pattern does stand there. I will rest it here. We have just a few minutes of break and then we can do question and answer. Professor, I've respected your time. Thank you, sir. God bless you.